Hi, my name is Alita Camp, and I'm welcoming you back to part two of an interview on CB8 Speaks with Deb Johnny Roy, Deputy Director of Hollaback, an organization whose mission is to make public spaces safe for everyone. Last time in part one, we spoke about bystander intervention for street harassment, and Deb Johnny gave us the five Ds, the various types of intervention. I encourage you, if you haven't seen part one, to go back on your computer on uh, this tab um, and CB8 Speaks and find part one of this interview because it's informative, it's engaging, and it's it's extremely important. Okay, welcome back. I'm Thank so glad you. to have you. I think it's been a great educational conversation and really useful, especially in the density of New York and yes. the Upper East Side where CB8 is. I wanted to ask you if you've ever been a victim of any kind of harassment. Yeah, I experience harassment pretty often, actually. Um, and it's often verbal harassment. Uh, it was, something just happened yesterday. I was going to the local bakery to pick up some cookies and a coffee, and someone was just like making noises like, pss, pss, hey, beautiful. And I was just, you know, in very ordinary clothes, and, you know, I wasn't even expecting anything like that. So that kind of stuff happens regularly, but I've also experienced someone who was publicly masturbating on a train um, and so publicly exposed themselves. And that was very shocking. There must have been a lot of people around. There were only a few people around on that train. I was on my way to work, and the guy was sitting next to, uh, in front of me, and he had um, taken one of the free papers, folded it up, and put it in front of him, and then he was trying to fumble with his zipper. And so I noticed what was happening, and I was also reading something. So once I noticed, I tried to look up to make him realize, like, I, you know, I know what's going on, and this is not okay. But of course, I was very scared. Um, so luckily, uh, at one of the stops, a couple stops before the work stop, someone got on and sat near me. And so then the guy moved to the far end of the train, and I still sensed something was not right. And so what I did is I put my phone on my lap and very, very subtly took a photo of him. I did not look at it until I got off the train and went above ground. Wow. I looked at the photo, and he was leg splayed, uh, newspaper in front of him, continuing with what he was doing. And I was horrified. I, I don't blame you. I remember once when I was in college, which yes. was a lot longer ago for me, I saw someone masturbating in Boston, in Cambridge, near the river. Yeah. And I went and I found the police afterwards when I was yeah. leaving. And they said, well, why didn't you get us right away? But that was pre-cell phones. Well, also, yeah. And then, I mean, the origin story of Hollaback points to an incident like this where um, she reported it to the officers, and they also said, well, he's, the guy's far, he's long gone now, so there's nothing we can really do about it. Um, but there are many types of harassment that I've faced, and one also is uh, regularly on my way to work, there was a man who was very friendly, it was good mornings and hellos, and watched that puddle, and very friendly uh, exchanges, and then all of a sudden one day it turned into sexual harassment, wow. and he started making comments. And from then on, I changed my route to work. And it's a burden to a place it on victims. It is a victims. burden, yes, absolutely. The fact that so many women have to change their normal course of, of their day um, to avoid these things is really absurd. And there's always a fresh group of women who yes. are going to be walking down that street who are potential exactly. victims as well. Yes, absolutely. I was checking in with interns, like, is this guy bothering you? And some of them had said yes. He said things to them as well. Has there been any work done to examine the effects of the interventions on harassers and whether it actually modifies their behavior? Yeah, so there have been some contained studies that have happened in high schools. One of the organizations that we started doing this work with, with bystander intervention, was called Green Dot. And they focus on sexual harassment, specifically on college campuses and military bases. And so we um, read a couple of studies that they've done, or they were affiliated with, at the University of Kentucky. And they did uh, look at the situation in a couple of high schools, I think a number of high schools around Kentucky, over the course of several years. Um, what happened before the training uh, around bystander intervention and what happened after. And they did see a significant decrease in the perpetration and victimization. So it's another reason that people should be involved to stop the potential yes. behavior from occurring in the future and affecting other yeah. people. Do you know if it has an effect on the intervener? 
um, whether there's a long-term effect, if they're more willing to become civically engaged or more willing to intervene in the future, or if it increases their self-esteem or their self-confidence or their view, it changes their view of the world. Yeah, that's a study I would love to see. Me too. <laughs> because I do know anecdotally that people who have shared their stories of intervention felt really good about what they did, and more importantly, they really felt for the person who is being targeted. And that's one of our most important points as an organization. We're trying to build up the sense of empathy for one another so that we can rely on each other to keep each other safe. That also sounds like it relates to your internet work. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's a difference that you do bystander street intervention yeah. and also bystander internet intervention. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit because it's, sure. it's very different, right? Yeah, it is different. So what's happening on the street, there's a very clear possibility of uh, physical alter altercations. It can escalate into things that affect you very immediately. Um, and that's not to um, minimize what happens online because I think there's a lot of minimization going on right now in terms of online harassment. So. We, we built a platform called HeartMob that addresses online harassment. And on this platform, we encourage people who have experienced online harassment to share their stories and to ask for the kind of help they need. And we provide um, some options for them. And simultaneously, we're trying to recruit bystanders online. So we um, have a network of bystanders who can cater and meet the needs of the person who's reporting their harassment. So there are two portals, two ways to get in. So are the bystanders who you're recruiting, are they there and available for more than one person? It's not just a chance event right. as it is in the street, but they're frequently or perhaps intentionally looking to help people. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this network of bystanders, every time someone puts a report in of their experience of online harassment, all the bystanders who have been very carefully vetted on our site, get they get an email saying, this is the report, um, this is where they're experiencing it, whether it be on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or um, through email, whatever it might be. And then they get the list of requests that that person has specifically put in. Now, the options of requests include the following. They can ask for the bystander to um, document the harassment for them, because sometimes the harassment happens uh, in a large volume. So it might be like a series of really horrible comments on YouTube, for example. So you'll ask the person to document, take screenshots of it, and file it as a report on the site. Uh, you could also ask for the bystander to send a supportive message of some kind, especially if you're getting a slew of hateful remarks about the way you look or your body or whatever it might be, you are asking for the bystanders to give you supportive messages like keep doing your work, um, keep doing a good job. Um, and then you could also uh, make a request for a bystander to report the harassment to the respective social platform that it's happening on. And so that's the third option. And then you could just generally click a I support you, I've got your back kind of a button to let them know that, that you support them. So there are many things you can do. And then there's an option where you can sort of ask for a specific tailored thing. For example, I was harassed online um, and I had asked people, it was on YouTube comments, it was a lot of really nasty stuff, including threats of sexual assault. Is to that me. because of the work you're doing with Hollaback? Yes, it was a video that oh, I had shame. done. Yeah, it's a video I had done around street harassment with my colleague. And the comments that were made were about my body, my gender, my race. Um, and threatening sexual assault and violence. Gee. And so I asked people, like, could you, in the comment section, put some positive messages just to silence or just drown out the negative, just toxic um, stuff that was on there. And so that was my tailored request for my, the bystanders that I had put out there. So there's so many options you can put out there. And does it work for people when it's, it's an anonymous series of harassments and it's an anonymous series of interventions? And do they, do the anonymity work for the interventions? Does that help? Did it help you? Yeah, it definitely helped me to go on that site, watch the video on YouTube, and to see the co positive comments, the encouraging ones, like keep doing what you're doing, this is important information. Um, and it's also important for other people to see those comments, the ones who are watching the video, especially younger populations um, who are still figuring out and deciding whether this is an important issue to pay attention to. They need to also see that other people are on board with this message around 
um, the video is about street harassment and how we should support each other. Um, and so they need to see this as well, that other people are interested in, in this work. Um, so in this particular case, it definitely helped me. Do you think that they were targeting you because you're a woman or because you're trying to stop harassment? Mm -hmm. Because from what I've read, people yeah. who try to stop harassment are targeted Even in themselves more. because yeah. of that work. Um, if you do this work, you are opening yourself up to a certain level of harassment. So it's both because of being a woman, being a woman of color, but also um, because of the work that we're doing and the message we're trying to put out there. There are so many people out there, the misogynists, the haters, who don't want this message out there. They're not interested in what we're trying to say. So it's for many reasons I think that we're targeted. And when we launched Heart Mob, we were also targeted. Um, in many different ways. We got a lot of nasty messages. We even got um, a threat of someone sending an image of someone with a gun. I mean, oh, that's violence. That's so scary. So there's death threats, there's rape threats. If you do this work, it, the internet has opened up this whole new opportunity for people to um, target you. Wow, I know that the New York Times recently published an article in which it referred to Heart Mob yeah. specifically and said that the site was getting so much harassment that it was reducing its online presence. Is that an accurate statement? No, that's something that happened early on with the site where when we did a pilot and launched the pilot version of it and we were still figuring out security issues. Um, but we've never backed away from uh, launching Heart Mob and for continuing with our, with our mission around Heart Mob. Um, it was not it was not an accurate statement fully. It, was, it, it wasn't the right quote. <laughs> I, was, I was surprised when I had read it, and it was just published within the last couple of weeks, right? Yes, it was. In fact, the writer of the article said that there's an overall sense of hopelessness with respect to eliminating or even reducing online harassment, although the writer was not necessarily of that point of view. But right. is that something you agree with, that it's hopeless? Um, I don't think it's hopeless. I do think it's a huge problem. And anyone who's working in this field can identify the fact that it's a huge problem. Um, but we could also identify that there are measures that can be taken that um, will lessen the impact on, on victims, on people who are being targeted, and those steps aren't necessarily being taken. The other thing is we're not fully understanding the scope and impact of online harassment. On the victim. On the victim. We're not really acknowledging that it does, even though it is different than real life harassment in many ways because of the immediacy of your physical well-being, sometimes online harassment does impact your real life in, on the ground. I know I haven't read that much about it, but I have, well, I've read about bullying mm -hmm. and about a town someplace in the South where yeah. there was a degree of bullying about someone. This was a few years ago, and I think that person ended up committing suicide yeah. over it. It has a horrible effect. It has a horrible effect. people, very debilitating effect. and psychologically destructive. Absolutely. So the impacts that I referred to earlier around street harassment, psychological impacts are similar. PTSD. Uh, trauma, anxiety, um, depression as well. Um, it, it impacts, even though it's happening in an online space, the thing is you can't really switch it off. It's like you have access to that space in your private space, right? So you could turn it on your phone, on your computer. Like it's everywhere. It's always there. It's always there. And also, if it's a contained space where you're being harassed in person and online, say it's in school or on a college campus, and the person might be known to you, um, that has also a doubling impact because it's happening in real life, but it's also happening in the online space. So do the interventions help with someone who is known to the victim, someone who's harassing that person online and in the street? Do interventions make a difference? Yeah, interventions definitely make a difference because when you're being harassed, that becomes sometimes the dominant voice that you're seeing um, and experiencing. And so if bystanders can come into play and send positive messages or do some online interventions of support, um, for people who've been targeted, a lot of like high profile media, feminists, thinkers, bloggers have been attacked. And so what some people have done is start uh, hashtag campaigns on Twitter where it's trying to elevate a positive message to that person and let them know that ultimately there are people out here who have your back more than the haters. And do you hear stories about the positive effects of that? Uh, do the victims post uh, stories about the success and their feelings about it as well as about the specific incidences in which they've been harassed? I think, so when people send supportive messages to you on the platform, you can write back to them 
Um, you could say you could say thank you. It's like a thank you button. You could also say that certain things have helped. But we've heard from people who have accessed the platform that it did counteract that negativity and harassment that they were experiencing. So it definitely um, has a positive impact, I would say. Um, it's not the end to all, you know, with all these forms of gender-based violence, like there's a platform that provides a solution maybe, but it's part and parcel of a greater uh, multi-prong approach. We have to also advocate with the social media companies. I wanted to ask you about yeah. that. Uh, how is that going? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we um, have worked with some social media companies when we were launching Heart Mob to make their reporting features a little bit more accessible to the people who would be using Heart Mob. So we came up with guides together on how to report. So it's things like that, also knowing how the systems work, if you want to block someone, if you're experiencing harassment and want to report them, um, having more tools at your disposal to be able to do that is really important. And sometimes that information is hard to find. It, it is, it, yeah. it is. Do the social media sites have, feel that there's any, uh, this may be a little off topic, but any responsibility when they're notified of that kind of harassment to do something about it? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of them have come up with tools of, you know, where you can report, where you can block someone. Um, of course, the advocacy work around that area has is ongoing because there's always room for improvement and in some cases a lot of improvement. Um, but, you know, some of these platforms self-admittedly have talked about the big challenges or the huge challenges that they're facing around this issue of harassment because then it gets into the territory of free speech and all of that, um, which I won't go into, but um, it's definitely a struggle, but we are advocating for something better. I think we all are. When we spoke, there was something you mentioned, the term I don't remember, but where a person's private information is posted yes. for the purpose of inviting harassment mm -hmm. or action against that person, whether it's based on religion or yeah. race or sex mm -hmm. or political point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and I've read about that in a small town in the Midwest, for instance, where people were targeted because of their religion and yes. all of their private information was posted. Do you work with that as well? Um, so that's called doxing. That's right. And of course, people can report experiences of being being doxxed on the heart mob platform um, have you seen that have people posted yeah people have posted some stuff like that that is a really um, we're, we're into the idea of prevention in that case and of course after something like that happens you can't just say okay it's about prevention but um, as a security measure we do have guides on how to clean your information um, offline or online um, so that it's not accessible. So we do have resources on HeartMob on how to do that. Um, we've had to do it ourselves, of course. Yeah, so that I information is inaccessible. Um, and that not, not just includes your information, but information of your loved ones, your family. It's scary. Um, because people go after families. They go after your partner. They go oh, after- really? um, Online? Yeah, they do. And they will maybe threaten to make their information public as well, not just yours. Um, and of course, there's a degree of severity of like the ways in which people have experienced this. And um, we've been pretty lucky so far in what, you know, we've, there have been threats of this happening to staff members, um, but we're making sure we're taking um, security measures and precautions. But there have been some high profile cases where people's information has gone public and um, they've received um, bomb threats or something that people also get is like they'll start getting um, delivery of pizzas that they're expected to pay for. There are many different tactics oh, that people wow. use. Yeah, and a lot of the people who do this kind of thing, they not, sometimes they do it individually, but they also try to mobilize others to do the same so that that person they're targeting is going to feel overwhelmed. And it's all anonymous, and there's the mob mentality, and it's easy to do something when it's anonymous and there's no individual responsibility. Right. Um, with some harassment, it depends on the platform. Say I have a blog, my personal blog, and I'm putting posts up there, and some people got, get on the blog and start harassing me. There are ways to find someone's, um, obviously, their IP address, so you know where they are, uh, country, the town maybe, but I think that's as far as it goes. And of course, the social media platforms can have access to some of that information. Um, there are also other precautionary measures that can be taken um, where you're verifying some, someone's identity before they're able to even get on a particular platform. Um, there's more security around that sort of thing. I guess that's what the Times had referred to, that people were creating false yes. false identities in order to overwhelm yes. heart mob. Um, well, 
they, that was sort of happening in the beginning. Well, now that, that's, what said, that's what they said. That's what they said. I know, right. that's, what, that's what they reported. <laughs> and I think that happens on all platforms where people are creating false identities um, so that they can, if they're kicked off for one identity, they can. So the security measures that we've taken to, um, to make sure that doesn't happen have been pretty effective. And we did that um, early on after we launched in early, uh, January 2016. And are there interventions that can work when there's doxing, or or are they specifically tailored for that? And do you have information about that on your yeah, website? Yeah, we actually have, similar to the training you attended, we have a training on online harassment by standard intervention. And so there are a number of different things people can do um, to effectively intervene as bystanders, not only through heart mob, but in other ways as well, um, reporting certain behaviors to um, the respective platforms, starting supportive hashtag campaigns, sending supportive messages. Right. All of those things can happen outside of HeartMob as well. I guess it's support, and that would go for some of the bystander training, the eye contact, sitting mm -hmm. next to somebody, the yeah. distraction. Mm -hmm. It provides yeah. a psychological level of you're not in this alone, and mm -hmm. even though it started with you yes. at first, we're here. Yeah. And in the street, does the, I, I know I asked you last time about escalating to violence, mm -hmm. but does anything ever turn against the bystander in the street or yes. online? Yeah. we've heard of many incidents, unfortunately, where someone directly intervened and they ended up getting physically assaulted. Oh, and there were some high scary. profile cases that happened a couple, I think a year or two ago um, here in New York City. And so that's why whenever we do our training, we're always telling people if you're going to directly intervene, um, to be very careful and assess your own safety as well. And sometimes delegation is the best way to go. And also bystander intervention is not, sometimes I think we focus a lot on the person who's perpetrating the harassment, but a lot of harassment is um, is verbal. A lot of harassment is nonverbal. A lot of it is um, not on the other side of that spectrum, right? So there's so many things we can do to help the person who's being targeted, and that is really the priority at the end of the day, not necessarily that direct, you know, grandstanding against the harasser. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind as well as a bystander. There are other things that you could do that don't put yourself in jeopardy, yes. because that would be a scary thing for someone to do. Absolutely. Do you know if there's a sexual difference? Are men or women more likely to intervene as a bystander? Yeah, I don't know the statistics on that, but what what I do know is that wh whoever you are in terms of your identity, so there's, of course, my gender, my sex, my racial identity, my um, maybe religious expression, or my size, right? that's all really going to impact the way you decide personally to intervene. And that's a big part of our training as well, is where we walk people through, going through that self-reflective process, like who are you in a particular situation? Always assess that first. Because say another um, woman of color is being harassed by a man and it's racist or xenophobic, I'm not going to want to directly intervene. And the method that I use when I use distract might be a little bit different because I, I'm really afraid for my own safety and well-being. Um, there was this video on YouTube, uh, Snack Man. It's Snack Man to the rescue. Man breaks up subway fight by fearlessly eating potato chips. Whoa, 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 whoa. A man and a woman were fighting on the subway. She said he'd been following her. Enter Snack Man. No, no, you. Had his hand up, inserted himself, continues to eat his chips. He's a big man, so he could get in between there and it immediately de-escalates. And other people are able to get in there and use the other forms of intervention. Um, so identity, to answer the question, identity has a huge role to play in how you decide to intervene with the five Ds. But have you noticed a difference in people being more or less likely to intervene if, let's say, the obvious one would, be, I mean, for me, it would be men or women. Yeah. Um, because there are always studies being done that right. men are more likely to do this to do and women this are more likely to do that. And, yeah. And if there is a different degree, does ha having an empathetic personality, does that affect right. whether someone intervenes or not? Yeah. So with the five Ds, I do think about, like, are they gendered? Like, are there ones that people are going to use more if they're male? Um, I do know a lot of men that I've talked to around this issue are very much afraid of their for their safety as well. Particularly, um, I could give an example of me being harassed when I'm with my my brother and him not wanting me to respond immediately because he's afraid that 
they, these men will take it out on him, right? So there's that at play as well, those kinds of dynamic, dynamics, as well as if you're with a child and you're doing a bystander yeah, move, certainly. you're not going to want to get in there in certain ways. You'll be able, if you're with a child, you'll be able to use delay and check in with the person after, or you might even be able to do a distract of some kind where you're just like, oh, I'm lost, or uh, we need a bathroom, my kid needs a bathroom, where's the local Starbucks or whatever. Um, there are different ways, depending on who you're with and who you are, that'll determine what form of intervention you can use. But in terms of like the gender, I'm not entirely sure what that would look like in terms of who, who intervenes more and in what situations. Um, and there's another piece of it as well, which is personality, right? Right, right. So if you're like an introvert or like in the middle ambivert and you, you're you not going to get in there, maybe maybe even like a distract is a little bit too much for you. Like you don't want to go up and talk to a stranger in the middle of something that's happening. Um, so I also do ask people to assess who they are as people, as individuals. Um, and of course, that's informed a lot by all of our identities and stuff like that. So, the psychology yeah. of it, I yeah. think, is fascinating, is. as it well is. as we talked about this the last time, the the long-term impact. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned that, it doesn't ha that the harassment has a long-term impact mm -hmm. on the victim, which is diminished somewhat by interventions, but and the interventions have a beneficial impact on the intervener, yeah. too, as well as on the harasser. Yeah. So it works well all the way around. All the way around. Um, also with certain interventions, say in the high school situations that I refer to in the studies that were done, it said it decreased the perpetration and the um, victimization. So from these interventions, especially when people are learning this behavior at a young age, those interventions also teach potential perpetrators or harassers that what they're doing is not okay. So they might learn that lesson in that interaction and then not do it from then onward. And that's the hope. I guess it depends on their personality yes. as well. And I know we, we didn't talk about this the last time, but that there are there may be incidents with children who are mm -hmm. being targeted because of their size or their hair color or yeah. their char physical characteristics or even because they have a peculiar name. Yeah. And if they're not in school um, and there's no adult who's charged with protecting them, yeah. is there have there been incidences where people are intervening with when there are children? Yeah, I think, um, especially here in New York City, you're passing by like playgrounds and schools and a lot of stuff happens outside of the school and there's not necessarily a parent around or, um, in those cases we really suggest if something is happening and you witness it to go to the front office to um, say something and do something and also like stand up for the kids, right? A lot of kids are being attacked in many different ways now uh, based on their identities, like the whole, you know, based on who they are and so we, want to make sure that we're standing up for, for everyone at this particular moment. There are so many different facets that are yeah. fascinating um, and educational and informative. What you do, your work is so important, especially in a city that's congested and dense. I'm really glad to have spent the time with you and I hope that any viewers out there feel the same way.